So the next test we'll discuss is CS101. This is the first conductive susceptibility type evaluation, which exposes the EUT to strong harmonic and ripple voltages uh, coupled to its input power lines while watching the signs, signs of degraded performance inside the EUT. This is again applicable to both AC and DC lines for all DOD platform installations. The CS101 limit is segregated into two curves uh, based on its input voltage. So curve two is intended for input voltages less than 28 volts or below, and while curve one is intended for input voltages greater than 28 volts. The CS101 test is limited to equipment drawing 30 amps or less. Equipment drawing more than 30 amps continuously are exempt from this test, which was reduced from 100 amps back in mill standard 461F and earlier versions. Um, since data revealed that the ripple voltage level on systems drawing more than 30 amps was generally higher than the curb two test criteria. So um, I'd also like to point out that the CS101 secondary power limit in addition to its primary voltage limit will be applied. This presents a not to exceed calibration value during testing when the primary voltage can't be achieved. Usually uh, issues can arise when the device has an integrated large bulk capacitor on the front end of its primary input for filtering purposes or for ride through of intermittent power interruptions. Uh, power limit here is determined by replacing the EUT with a half ohm resistor while achieving the voltage criteria of curve one over the entire test frequency range. Now during the CS101 test, the coupling transformer is installed on each ungrounded power line separately uh, and a 10 microfarad cap is placed across those power lines differentially uh, right just before the, the lizard termination as you can see here. The caps provide a low impedance path for the CS101 currents to circulate through the EUT, in turn protecting the lizens and the power source from these uh, harmful ripple voltages. And as a primary voltage level is increased, the generator settings are monitored not to exceed the secondary power limit settings determined during the calibration. Now, test method CS114 is a conductive susceptibility test level used to evaluate the effects of RF currents coupled to the device's input power and interconnecting cables from nearby radiated sources on the platform. Therefore, CS114 testing is required on all installation platforms and all procurement agencies. And the test is performed on cabling that interfaces with the DUT including power signal, alarm, or really any interconnecting cable that is current carrying. This is performed between 10 kilohertz and 200 megahertz. The CS114 test levels is segregated into five curves, which are applied to each platform type identified across the top of, uh, of this table. The applicability of the curve level uh, for a particular platform is further defined by four frequency bands, as well as each procurement branch of the DoD shown along the left side of the chart. Uh, you'll notice that the curve levels for a given platform vary between branches uh, and frequency bands. In the highlighted example here, you'll see that the Navy, all Navy ships above decks and submarines for external platforms the 10 kilohertz to 2 megahertz band utilizes curve 2, but increases the curve 5 from 2 meg to 200 meg, whereas the Navy ship's below deck platform utilizes curve 2 across the entire test range. You may also have noticed that the small frequency band between 4 kilohertz and 1 megahertz is only applicable to Navy ships and submarines. This test range is, has been added by the Navy due to low frequency common mode noise appearances on ships which utilize solid state power generation technologies. Uh, now the CS114 signal calibration uh, process requires two methods to validate the correct injection level prior to testing. The first injects a signal through an RF amplifier to uh, an RF injection clamp positioned around a coaxial test fixture. 
The directional coupler in line with the amp and the injection clamp is used to monitor and record the applied forward power during the cal. One side of that coaxial fixture is terminated into 50 ohms and the other into a second coaxial test fixture with a current monitoring clamp uh, placed around that and then into an RF attenuator finally into the measurement receiver which has a, a characteristic 50 ohm termination impedance. This calibration setup re represents a 50 ohm matched environment presenting a loop impedance of 100 ohms. And that test signal is increased uh, until the appropriate test level is reached at that measurement receiver. Now keep in mind that due to the receiver accounting for half of the total loop impedance, only half of the injected voltage will be measured there. But once the level is reached um, at each test frequency, the forward power will be recorded. Now, MIL standard 461 requires that the current monitor be in line during the process to ensure that any potential signal loading caused by the probe is accounted for. This is something new to MIL standard 461 and wasn't required in earlier versions of the standard. So the, the current monitoring clamp must be terminated into 50 ohms as well. Now, once that calibration is complete, the test levels are then verified by moving the measurement receiver to the current probe and the terminating the far end of the coaxial loop into 50 ohms. That the field levels or forward power recorded during the original calibration will be played back and verified that the injected, the correct injection current levels are, are received. Now the test setup requires that that injection clamp and current monitor probe are, are positioned around each power cable and each interconnecting cable individually. The forward power is then increased until either the calibration settings are met or the maximum induced current level is reached, whichever comes first. It's important to note here that the amount of injected current based on a given forward power will depend on the impedance of the particular cable under test. And you'll hear this for a variety of the tests using an inductive injection method. Uh, it's, it's a common struggle to achieve forward power levels when the testing a shielded cable with a very low loop impedance. However, the injected current is likely to far exceed the test requirement if not carefully monitored. So that, that's the purpose of having this current monitoring clamp in line. Alternatively, the forward power levels that are achieved are easily achieved on a high impedance cable well before the, the current levels are, are reached. So in this example, um, you can see really the injected test current varying from the maximum test current level plus 6 dB uh, to a well below the current level at various frequencies along a test range as a result of cable resonances and other influences uh, over that frequency range. So you can see the, the importance of having a current monitor as well as using forward power uh, monitoring during the actual test. The CS-115 is another conductive susceptibility test uh, designed to excite a natural resonance on the cable bundle during fast transient pulses similar to those observed in platform switching events or external sources such as near strike lightning or even an external electromagnetic pulse. CS-115 is primarily applicable to aircraft or space and ground platforms it is only applicable to surface ship and submarine external applications when specified by the Navy procurement. Uh, the photo, photo here shows a typical injection setup for CS-115. I will note here that it's similar setup you'll see for CS-114 as well as CS-116. Now the pulse waveform is depicted as a short pulse approximately 30 nanoseconds in width with a sharp rise and fall time, usually no greater than two nanoseconds in duration. And these are measured between the 10% and 90% of each rise and fall. Pulse amplitude is set to five amps for all applications and applied at a rate of 30 Hertz for one minute. In reality here, yeah, that pulse is not very square as shown. However, as long as the peak amplitude and rising and falling edges are met, are met then it's, it's, it's acceptable for use.
So as CS115 is intended to excite a cable resonance by injecting a current pulse using fast transition times, CS116 actually simulates that cable resonance by injecting a damp sinusoidal transient at different frequencies across the usable band for that cable. This is applicable to all installation platforms except for submarines. The damp sinusoidal signal is an oscillatory pulse waveform uh, that gradually decays with each cycle. In terms of energy, the CS116 waveform damping factor, also known as a Q, must fall within a range of 10 to 20. This is determined by the difference between the peak cycle current divided by the peak current at the closest cycle to 50% of the decay point. It's common for the Q to be met usually between the fourth to sixth cycle of that waveform. The test damp sinusoidal waveform is applied at a range of discrete frequencies from 10 kilohertz to 100 megahertz in order to locate a particular cable resonant or frequency. Uh, however, the, the cable resonant frequency, uh, if, if it's known and it resides within the te CS116 test frequency range, it should also be tested. So the CS116 test levels gradually ramp from a maximum peak uh, of 10 amps between 1 megahertz and 30 megahertz, and then decay in amplitude to 100 meg. This ramp is similar to CS114 and represents the typical cable coupling efficiency over the test frequency range. To achieve a one quarter electrical wavelength at 10 kilohertz, that cable would need to be roughly 7,500 meters long, whereas at 30 megahertz, it would only require to be at a length about two and a half meters. So, however, beyond 30 meg, the cable impedance begins to dominate, resulting in natural attenuation of induced current. So that's really just a description of why the, the current varies the way it does. And again, here's an example of the CS116 test setup. As mentioned, it's, it's very similar to CS115 as well as CS114. Now the CS117 test here is used to evaluate the effects of indirect lightning strikes. And this testing is limited, has limited applicability specifically for aircraft and surface ships, above deck locations, of course as well as some space platform applications. Lightning tests can also be selected for certain army ground platforms, uh, but it's not common. Now testing is recommended for all aircraft safety critical related equipment, cabling for non, as well as non safety critical equipment cabling that may be connected to equipment performing safety critical functions. And additional guidance can be found in SAE ARP 5416 which covers the aircraft lightning uh, test requirements and me methods for um, SAE. Now, MIL standard 461 CS117 provides default lightning test levels and waveform selections. And they're provided for two general installation categories defined as internal and external locations. These represent typical applications and should only be used by default when no platform data is, is available. Um, so meaning if a physical test has been done to determine that a, a particular aircraft or platform will have a particular transfer function of the external lightning strike to inner cables, that data should be used to determine which, which value should be applied. And here are the six types of lightning waveforms that will be selected. Each are representative of the induced coupling effects of a direct lightning strike. Variations in this waveform rise time and duration are caused by that transfer function and impedance of the aircraft fuselage material. Damp oscillatory waveforms are representative of an aircraft resonant occurring along portions of the external platform structure. Now, lightning strikes have three applications. Uh, the first being a single stroke, which represents the initial lightning stroke attachment to the platform. Multi-stroke is representative of a cloud to ground strike in which the main leader of the lightning stroke has, uh, has attached to the platform. Branches that are formed off of that lightning strike uh, off the main leader can reattach 
causing a return stroke to retrace the main leader's path. This causes what we call subsequent strokes, randomly spaced over a period of roughly one and a half seconds. So um, as that occurs, the initial stroke, um, multi-stroke applications across the 13 subsequent strikes randomly spaced over one half second period. This will usually be done in conjunction with a single stroke environment. The multi-burst re is representative of an aircraft passing through a charged cloud, causing multiple fast bursts of lightning and discharges to occur. However, these occur in groups of pulses during the initial attachment and detachment phase of the lightning discharge. Multi-burst applications consist of a burst of randomly spaced continuous uh, charges con uh, continuously applied for a period of five minutes. Now the lightning waveforms are calibrated for open circuit voltage and short circuit current using an inductive coupling transformer, as you can see here. That photo shows a lightning transform in the lower left-hand corner with a single turn shorting conductor positioned around its secondary. The general CS117 lightning setup is shown here with the injection transformer and current monitoring clamp positioned around a particular cable to be tested. Again, much like we saw in test methods CS114, 115, and 116. However, a high impedance voltage probe is also placed around the injection transformer to capture the applied voltage waveform as well. Now when applying these lightning transients, it's important to understand the difference between the test requirements and limit level. The lightning calibration is used to ensure that the generator is capable of meeting the voltage and or current waveform test requirement. But as the impedance of the cable is, uh, as the impedance of that cable being tested is likely to fall somewhere between the open condition and the short condition, the actual lightning generator setting will need to be adjusted gradually in order to prevent over testing. So as the amplitude is increased, the waveform test level is, is either voltage as a VT or current as an IT must be reached before the waveform limit, which is VL or IL. If the limit is achieved before the test level is reached, then the test is halted in order to prevent overstressing and possible damage to the UT. The waveform set at that point must be reevaluated to match the type of interface being tested or cabling being tested. So the next is CS118. This subjects the EUT to electrostatic discharge is commonly known as ESD. ESD is applicable to all platforms and procurements except for space applications as well as munitions or ordnance systems. These are covered under their own specific ESD test standards. The human body model ESD waveform consists of a 150 picofarad capacitor as well as a 330 ohm resistive network and has been derived from internationally recognized standards such as IEC 61004-2. Mill standard 461 requires that this waveform be calibrated prior to testing using a standard two ohm coaxial resistive network to verify the, the waveform meets the particular rise time and the 30% tolerance criteria shown in this graph. And, a, and the electrostatic voltmeter is also used to measure the peak ESD voltage level prior to the application. Now ESD is applied using either a contact discharge or air discharge test method. A contact discharge is the preferred, due, preferred method due to better control of the applied current and less influence caused by environmental conditions. The contact discharges are applied using a tapered tungsten tip uh, precisely to inject that pulse onto a conductive surface. However, when the test point won't accept a contact discharge, uh, it will usually be retested using an air discharge method. This utilizes a bevel tungsten tip shaped similar to that of a human fingertip. And the ESD generator is allowed to quickly engage the target from a distance until the ESD arc discharge occurs. In this case, five positive and five negative pulses will be applied to each test point 
for a maximum test level of 8,000 volts for contact and 15,000 volts for air. Any location that is accessible by a human fingertip should be considered for ESD testing, such as chassis mount points, displays, button, knobs, etc. Uh, the test discharges can be, uh, they can cause various levels of interference in immediate as well as latent damage to circuitry. So low impedance chassis grounding utilizing protection circuits of exposed ESD and ample separation of sensitive components and circuits from the ESD current pass are often offered as general guidance.